Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is James Harding. Uh, I'm the editor of Tortoise, and uh, welcome to our newsroom. Uh, a few hours ago, uh, the sort of tables were all lined up here. This is where we work, where we try and figure out each day how we're going to produce the Daily Sense Maker, commission the podcasts, work on the data journalism and orchestrate the events that are tortoise journalism. But the heart of it has always been this, the idea of having an open newsroom and having what we call a thinking. And a thinking is a sort of rather grand word for saying, let's get together in a room and try and figure out where a story goes, what it means. And we've tended to do them in one of two ways. One has been, if you like, exploratory, i.e. there's something here in the subject area and we'd like to get a group of people together to discuss it and we hope that people will come in either with a story or an idea we can follow up. Or we tend to do it as something that is explanatory and, if you like, uh, an exercise in uh, reflection where we've already done a piece of work and we go over it again and we say, okay, what have we learned? What do we get right? What do we get wrong? And where does it go from here? And actually, in the case of the Tavistock, we're actually trying to do both. We, we held actually a series of thinking. So we held one specifically on the Tavistock, um, you know, well over a year ago now. And from it, we heard a number of different stories, but we left thinking, hang on, we still don't really understand how this place works. And the reason that it seemed so interesting was obviously you had a whole bunch of things happening at the same time, right? You had the intersection of care and politics, you had the intersection of young and old, you had the intersection of London and the whole of the country, all around an issue that was proving to be, you know, you know volcanically uh, controversial. How could we do this in a way that was calmer, slower, and made sure that you would at the very least understand different people's points of view. So just to tell you how kind of journalism and commissioning works, not very scientifically. I call Polly Curtis, uh, we've worked together in different ways in lots of places, but Polly had been a partner here, an editor. Polly had done probably the most difficult piece of journalism that we had done at a stretch on the family courts, where we looked at the way in which the courts had intervened and separated parents and guardians from children. And so on the basis that no good deed goes unpunished, I said, actually, Polly, would you mind having a go at the Tavistock? And the question we're really trying to get at is, can we understand? Can we understand different people's points of view? Can we understand what happens there? Can we understand if there is a right answer uh, to the questions that have surrounded uh, uh, GIDS? And so Polly and Katie Gunning sort of set about that for, what was it, six, eight, nine months? Nine months. And if you haven't had a chance to listen to uh, the podcast, the Tavistock, please do. But the good news is if you haven't, you're going to be OK because you're going to find out most of it from uh, Polly and Katie in the course of this evening. But just so you know, what we're trying to do tonight is we'd like to hear from you, as many people as possible as we can in the room. We're not going to do this thing where it's like we're going to rasp away for uh, you know 45, 50 minutes and then have 10 minutes to the end. We'd like to get at that really from the start. Um, likewise, you know, my colleague Mark St. Andrew is here. He's making sure that I don't a, lose track of time, and B, lose track of the chat online. We can bring people in on the screen so we hear from them as well. Um, and I suppose what I'd hope is that at the end, we might come away with the answer to two questions. One is, where do we think we should go journalistically next? And also, just honestly, what do we think we got right and wrong in the reporting of the Tavistock so far? Uh, so please catch my eye. Some people I know, some people I really don't. So when you do, please just say your name. Uh, if you're happy to do that, if you're not, don't. But, you know, uh, do that. And then at the end, I'll try and pull together some notes of what I thought. My job as sort of editor is just to scribble away notes and try and come at the end of it and go, OK, here's what I think, well, here's where I think it can go, for, go, go next. But Polly, should we just do a quick sort of 
catch up on where you are if you if you weren't a listener to the to the Tavistock. Um, wh- wh- why don't I start at the end of the process, which is whether or not the the process of reporting it changed your mind, changed your thinking. Thank you, James. <laughs> oh, you need a mic. Oh, yes. There's a there's a subtly branded mic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so. I remember when you called me up because I was walking on the heath and you take a call from James because he's usually got a really good idea, really he's interesting idea. And I, and when he told me what the idea was, I thought that's probably the hardest last story in the world I want to get to do, but it really needs doing. And I really, you know, it, it, it's the, an important story to try and unpack in a way that makes it accessible to people. And I think kind of my starting point, so did I change my mind? My starting point was I really didn't have any a settled view on it. I'd kind of watched this thing happen from afar, felt kind of scared by the tone of the debate, scared by the language, by the kind of difficulty around it. Um, and that felt like a real blocker to understanding it. So um, the first thing I wanted to do was to to try and show people the complexity of what was going on and i think we hit upon a phrase we don't we didn't want to tell anyone what to think we wanted to kind of show the difficulty of what was being dealt with um the the truth in people's experiences and that those experiences could be very different and still both be true so I, th- I think, I mean, it's funny listening to you here. I remember us sitting at the table where, in front of where my colleague Sarah is sitting now, and thinking we, we, we did have one really chewy conversation early on, mm. which was, what is the question? Mm. Do you remember that? What, what's the question we're actually trying to answer? And, and do you want us to talk people through where we, where we landed up on, and why? Well, we started, the, 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 question, the question we landed on there was, Basically, it's our puberty blockers, the right way to go. Is this the right treatment? Um, but through the course of reporting it then, I then realized that there was very limited kind of scientific settled evidence on that. And I think what we were trying to do at the beginning was actually put some kind of guardrails around it so that it didn't become a story about the whole debate happening across society. But I think what we realized quite quickly was that it was that debate to a certain extent. You couldn't report what was happening in the Tavistock and what was happening in those treatment rooms and how those decisions were being made without reflecting on what was happening in wider society and that these things are all kind of interconnected. But I think the only reason I was pointing that out because I think that I'd like to be honest and open about mm. how we got there because people might have a kind of fundamental question with whether we were asking the right question and in pursuit mm. of the right question. <laughs> Just the things that we were trying to avoid is we didn't want to do a, uh, if you like, the story of a row, right? Here's what trans activists say, here's what feminist activists say, here's the reasons why they're, everyone's cross. We were trying to understand what was happening inside a very, very particular unit in, inside the NHS. And I think, and I think Polly, one of the thing, thoughts was if you, if you're ag- agreed on gender dysphoria and you're agreed on the idea of not just therapeutic treatment but medical treatment, puberty blockers gets you to the fundamental question of at what stage is a medical intervention right for children? And that's, mm. that, that would seem to be the sort of central... Is that right? That would seem to be the kind of central controversy at the, at the Tavistock. Is that, is that fair? I, th- I think... I think that's right, but over the course of the time that the external debate is so, um, the external kind of um, pressures is so kind of key to those decisions being made. Um, external what, pressures as in as media, in, as social in the media. media, the row, the politics, kind of lastly, those all kind of come come to bear on it so intensely. And really kind of where we end up now is kind of what do we as a society think is the right thing to do and and what do we what are, what are we kind of willing to accept it's it's when you know polly said the thing 
Right at the polycarmine. beginning, polycarmine. Actually, well, just for those people who haven't listened to everything, forgive us if you have listened to it, but do you, do you want to just tell people, in effect, the sort of the arc of what happened over the six episodes and mm -hmm. who you spoke to? I know it'll take a couple of minutes, but I think it's useful. Yeah. So what, what we thought was most important at the beginning was that we f when, when I went and read every report that had been done and all the paperwork that's out there and all the reporting that was out there, I felt, I don't know the Tavistock story. I don't know what happened inside for the people who were being treated there and who were working there. I, I hadn't heard that story. Um, so I felt it was really important to kind of go to the Tavistock and say, will you, will you share your story? Um, but on a basis that wasn't any kind of special access or kind of like there was no deal done. We just wanted to kind of hear what happened. So the kind of central thing we had was an interview with Polly Carmichael's, the clinical director um, at JIDS, which is the clinic that's relevant at the Tavistock. Um, and we did about uh, about six interviews um, over about nine hours. Is that right, Katie? Yeah. Um, where we, where we 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 went over, and she will say we went over and over and over. And we we talked we talked about it. But the the central kind of question we were getting at is who gets the blockers and who doesn't. Like, how do you decide? How do you know what the right thing is for each individual child? And I think. What, what you learn through the series is that a lot of the reporting, a lot of the stories that have been told about the Tavistock, that there was like a fast track into puberty blockers and, a, you know, all, all of those stories, that, that they, they weren't true. That's not the story I heard. I, I heard um, a, a story about a clinic that was incredibly thoughtful, incredibly exploratory, very different approaches. I think lots of different people had different experiences within the Tavistock. Um, and I think that was disrupted by <coughs> shortages and then um, very long waiting lists and lots of different experiences. But I felt like we got to a better version of the truth, which is not kind of an ideologically riven organization, but an organization trying to keep its head in amongst a culture war um, that, was just getting louder and louder and louder. And I don't think it managed to keep its head at all times, um, but I don't think it was fast tracking people to puberty blockers in the way that it's been accused. Well, it was accused of both things, wasn't it? It was accused yes, of fast tracking yeah. and being and then blocking. slow. Yeah. 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 Um, before we just go on a further, does that feel? Does, does anyone have a strong view about whether that was the right question to focus on, or whether there was a different way of thinking about things? So oh. yes, would you say your name? Is uh, I'm come back to, to you in a moment. Sir, so, uh, hi, yeah, my name's uh, Keith <coughs> Jordan. Um, your name, sorry, sir, Keith Jordan. Keith. Um, yeah, um, the question um, about the puberty blockers. Um, I've got a question for you. Did you actually ask in, uh, in the course of this? whether it was actually even ethical in the first instance to consider administering um, drugs to children with perfectly healthy bodies? Was that a question that was So which, do you want to do that, Paul, or shall I? So, he, so, I mean, so our starting point was, our starting point was to recognise, so, so we didn't get drawn into the argument about gender dysphoria as an illness. We said, because when we spoke to all of the medical practitioners, not least, you know, a bunch of trans people, we were like, OK, let's understand the, and, and recognise gender dysphoria. The question was, how was it being treated? And understanding the choices that therapists and medical practitioners and individuals and families were making. So actually... The questions that then arose, I, th I felt, I don't know whether you feel this fair, Polly, but I felt the question that arose then about puberty blockers were, I suppose, really two. One was, at what age is it right to medically intervene? This was obviously the, the issue that came before the High Court. But then, as Polly said, one of the other big issues was trying to understand the medical evidence <clears throat> on the, the efficacy and the impact that was having on young people. And, you know, as you said, one of the things that was really difficult in this whole process was that the number of people coming to the Tavistock grew so rapidly mm. um, and far outstripped, I think, what you got in terms of medical evidence. Mm. That, so that was, the, that was the thinking. 
Yes, Steph, and so I'm going to come to you in one moment. I'm going to, uh, we, one, one thing I should say, Keith, is that we cheated in this particular uh, incident, is that we had a number of different families come to talk to us, thinkings like this, over time, but also a colleague of ours, Steph, uh, had, sort of had direct experience of the Tavistock too. Do you want to, do you want to just tell what your experience yeah. is? You, you can hear Steph Preston on yeah. the podcast too. <laughs> yes, yes. So I'm Steph, pronouns are they, them, and I'm in the podcast. My kind of, st my story, as I would, would describe it, it kind of started when I was 13, I think it was. And I kind of had something to say to you as well, Keith, in that I think there can be a question about whether it's ethical, but I don't think we're holding other medications to the same ethical standards in that respect, because there may be people who have ADHD, or there may be people with learning difficulties or other um, mental difficulties or mental illnesses that we do medicate in children. But you might say they have a perfectly healthy body. But if you're willing to medicate them for, say, depression or ADHD or anything else, when their body may be perfectly healthy, as we see it, then why are we not holding those medications to the same ethical standards? Because as I made clear in the podcast, I really wish I had got blockers earlier. And I was at the Tavistock for three and a half, nearly four years, and I had no medical intervention. I had purely therapeutic and investigative kind of consultations and appointments to really get to the root of it and understand, is this right for me? And is this the right route? And I maintained it was. And whilst I would have liked to get blockers earlier, I think the question doesn't need to be about whether it's ethically correct, because we're obviously not holding other medications to the same standards. But as James said, as Polly has said, at what point is it okay for us to be giving these medications? At what point do we deem someone to be capable of making that decision of their parents, whether their parents have the final say, whether the doctors or the child? I think there's so many other decisions and factors that are more important because ethically it comes down to what's best for the child. And I'm living proof that seven years later, nearly eight years later, it doesn't go away. I'm still here. I am still trans. It was purely a case of getting the help at a much later time. But I, I mean, just Keith, just to your point, you do you do raise a thing which was obviously, you know, one of the difficult issues in, in choosing this subject was how do you give voice to people who are skeptical of the whole uh, of the whole question of medical treatment. Our choice, journalistically, was that if you entered into that debate, you would not really get to the questions that were being chosen by the Tavistock. So if you said, look, the judgment is that we question the existence of gender dysphoria and we therefore question <coughs> whether or not there is a, it is the, the right thing to use, to use puberty blockers, actually we wouldn't be able to understand the choices that were being made by practitioners in the, in the Tavistock. And so while we recognise that there are those people who have that debate, Actually, what seemed to us was more helpful, just as a listener, would be to say, look, we recognise the existence of gender dysphoria, we recognise that a choice in treatment is puberty, is, is, is puberty blockers. The question is, when and how might those be prescribed? And try to understand the choice of the Tavistock so that people, even people who think, well, look, I don't think that they should be prescribed at all, could at least understand the workings of that particular unit. I hope that makes Makes sense. Is that, is that fair, yeah, count, Katie? I think it is kind of not, not. It was. It wasn't so much a question of if, but but when and and, well, and as who. And when those yeah, like right. how how do you actually understand when that is the right course of treatment for yeah. someone? Yeah. Because there isn't enough. There 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 isn't enough evidence of the, on this overall, but there isn't lots of evidence that there are lots of people who have had a bad experience on. Um, puberty blockers. I'm going, to, I'm going to come you here. The other thing is amazing was all of this. You could hear yourself pausing because when you get the wrong word, so I'm going to get the wrong word. That there was not a lot of evidence of people who, having had puberty blockers, 
regretted it. Well, there's not a lot of evidence. Full generally, stop. there okay. generally isn't enough evidence. But on the balance of what evidence there is, there it, it, it does suggest that this course of treatment is good for some people. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what were you going to say? Sorry, I, um, Victoria Phillips. I think, Polly, you kind of hit the nail on the head, which is, it seemed to me from listening to your podcast and also from my widened reading, is there's just an, uh, not enough collection of data. We don't know. And, and the, the thing that came out from your podcast is there wasn't enough tracking of individuals who had um, been given puberty blockers or not as to yeah. what happened to them. There wasn't any tracking. Well, yeah. yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, so that's the thing that I find about the whole debate so alarming, that there's not enough data. And then that goes back to the point I think you were trying to make is how can either the individual or their parents, if they're not Gillick competent, consent to a treatment that nobody really knows the long-term effects of. That's where I'm very concerned. And Victoria, just a bit, just a bit because I, I see there are two things. You, I, I can sort of, I, I think we journalistically w went for that too, thought, oh, this is, this, this is gonna work. We'll get inside the corridors of the Tavistock and we'll begin to see the reams of data and also, in a way, be able to sort of dodge the whole ethical debate about it because we'll be able to get clarification through the science. But that that didn't happen, did it? And, and to be fair to the practitioners in the Tavistock, they they were very clear. There wasn't the evidence. It wasn't just there wasn't it there in the UK, but there wasn't the evidence globally. Even the Netherlands stuff wasn't yeah. conclusive, right? Well, it, well, the questions so I'm channeling kind of. Um, some of the people I interview, but the, the question is, oh, what would conclusive evidence look like? How long would you right. track people to know whether whether this was the right treatment for them? Um, and over the, you know, this is, it's worth just saying what a huge change has happened in the last 10 years. The numbers increased so rapidly in the last 10 years um, <laughs> that, you know, it would be really hard to have, have had evidence. And, and and this treatment was only off of the last 11. Yeah. So you were going to say something. Um, will you pass the, where's the mic? Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you, Mike Francis. Um, this is such a febrile subject, it really is. Yeah. So to answer your question, James, about was that a good question to ask? I think it was, because it was a sort of a microcosm of the culture wars. Yeah. So by fleshing that out, you start to explore the complexities and the and the just sheer competitiveness of both sides. Mm. And if you hadn't done that, it would have been harder to identify the nub, the nexus of this. So if you think about it, there appears to be very little in the middle on this. There's the hard line, how could those professionals diagnose something which they had no evidence for to we were trying to help, they're struggling, they've got difficult lives, why don't we try to help them? And it is, the, the issue is, is there a middle ground? So actually, I think it was an excellent question to ask. And, and, and Mike, you, you, you know you mentioned this point about the data, that yeah. there was no data forthcoming. Well, I remember when I read the High Court judgment, the Gillick competent case, one of the criticisms of the judges who incidentally took the same sort of approach as us, which was they part gender dysphoria and what they, they, they just fundamentally focused on who is competent to make the decision. They also did reprimand the Tavistock at the time, didn't they, for the failure to collect enough data. And I, I mean, you, you raised that. Mm. Is that a, I don't know where you stand on this whole thing. And, and actually there's been a wonderful comment in this, which is the picture is very complicated. But do you come away, is that one of your thoughts about this, one of the lessons? Yeah, I mean, how to, to me it was pretty extraordinary how you were diagnosed with no data. But it's quite interesting because I've got personal experience because my son had some really challenging times and he was in a special school where the school collected no data of the pathway of the 18-year-olds beyond that to establish whether or not they were uh, helped and, and how that would help the journey with other kids. So I understand why you might not do that. It's such a new thing. But it seems to me devastatingly negligent not to keep that data. Is there anyone else? Sir, yeah. 
So I realize I'm about to get something massively wrong here because I'm keeping saying, sir, this and then. And so I'm like, that's, that's yes, fine. So yes. Um, my name, my name yeah. is Jordan. Um, and uh, I listen to the <coughs> podcast with, with a lot of interest because um, I, I work as an academic and I've also been researching the Gender Identity Development Service at the Tavistock um, from an academic rather than journalistic perspective, but I've spent a fair amount of time there myself. Um, and I guess just one, one thing that's forming in my that was forming in my mind, trying to make sense of everything I've heard kind of attending meetings there is the way in which at least it could be argued that the severe under resourcing that the service faced, you know, the fact that the waiting list was so huge, the fact that they did not have the resources, well, arguably did not have the resources to pursue the research that they should have pursued um, means that in some sense it was kind of set up to fail. I mean, in the sense that, you know, and I heard this over and over again from clinicians I was speaking to that when children and their families arrived, they'd waited so long, and, and this was featured in the podcast, right, but that they'd waited so long to be seen with so little support that they were absolutely certain of what they needed and very resistant to any of the kind of therapeutic exploration that the clinicians were trying to do, which is not to say the outcome would be different necessarily, but just to say they weren't helped for so long they come in a miserable state. And it's no wonder that a number of them therefore end up quite miserable because um, a critical period when they needed help you know, was not provided for them. And so I guess the, the, the thing I was thinking about, maybe one, one aspect that I felt like could have been highlighted a little bit more in what was otherwise a really excellent podcast was this kind of political question around the NHS in general, austerity and cuts in the ways that the NHS fails in so many different arenas and how that seems to be the case as well for, for the Tavistock. Well, Jordan, can I just ask you a question? There, there, there was, as I was just saying, a poly, there were two of these criticisms weren't there of the Tavistock. One was that it was gung-ho mm. and the other that it was stuck in the mud. I, either you, either it was like, hang on, these people are prescribing puberty blockers to young people and it's creating a huge and growing demand, gung-ho, or it's have you heard the stories of trans children who mm. go there and then find themselves stuck in a seemingly endless queue that adds to their, you know, anxiety, distress, etc. Mm. Just having studied it, w which of those two critiques of the Tavistock do you think <laughs> is... Truer. I, I I mean, I'd like to say neither in a sense, right? right? Okay, which probably. is which is the sense people waited for a very long time and it definitely added to. Uh, so I, I don't agree. I think both of you are absolutely right. Say it was not a service that was fast tracking anyone. I mean, it takes a. It, it was very clear that it took a tremendous amount of time and very few people ultimately were prescribed puberty blockers. But in terms of, so, so people waited a very long time. That's very clear. But in terms of whether that the the effect was that whether the, those people ultimately identify as trans or not. They were people in distress who were not receiving the support that they needed. And I feel like that that kind of came out in the last episode of the podcast. But that to me seems like the real issue and also connected to the larger political issue of the NHS itself being underfunded. Okay. So I'm gonna, so I'm gonna come come to you. Can, can, can I just ask you guys one one just one question before I do so just one one thing. Which is one of the things that I was really uncomfortable about now we're having this out, <laughs> in our <laughs> podcast, was our attempt to try and understand uh, suicide numbers, mm. the relationship between suicide and the conduct of the Tavistock. And by the way, you could really tell that with, I can't remember if it was with Polly Carmichael, it was with, the, the only time that you really felt when you heard from Polly Carmichael that she wasn't completely... Mm at ease with this conversation was around that. And I just wondered, having reflected on that, because it, it gets to your point, Jordan, on the question about whether delays were having real impacts on mental health. And then, by the way, if you're a journalist, you get this, you get taught very, very early on that you can't ascribe cause to suicide. And so how do you explain, how do, how do we explain the fact that we were looking at those suicide numbers in an attempt to try and understand the Tavistock? So, um the answer is that we weren't looking for that story. That's not what, what we went looking for. Um, and we didn't in any way try to explain why people might have taken their lives um, because we simply didn't know. Um, but when I came across the number um, of 15 suicides over an unspecified period of time, um it felt 
absolutely critical to report yeah. that as a fact, but not try to explain why, because, you know, people have said, you know, suicides might be because of this, or it might be because of that, or or mm. they might be happening at another point, or any of it. I just didn't go there, but I felt if we hadn't have reported what we found out from very good sources, we would be covering up something that was potentially yeah. more important than anything else. So and also being discussed think, in the room. I mean, and I'm being really... discussed, and, and so I, you know, I know we i know it was really really hard to get that right there's a lot of risks involved in that yes. and i don't think there was a right you know there was it was a very imperfect situation but i felt like i couldn't look myself in the mirror if we hadn't um reported what we found and yes. oh, sorry. Oh, okay and, and also just cuz it it seemed to be part of the the reason why the clinic was shutting earlier than everyone thought mm. it would. It seemed to be part of the story of why the closure was fast tracked, which is yeah. why the number was important to our reporting as well. That, the, the, that it was, that it was well, good, that significant. It, it was because the delays. The source, yeah. Polly's source, um, that link between that, that for whatever reason those those deaths might have happened, that number had come up in the context of the future of JITS and the timescale. And, and it was so being closed because closure. it was frustration. Mm -hmm. And because there was concern about safety of people in the system, not because of the treatment that JIDS was giving, but because of the absence of management of people who are on the waiting list, which is a wider, and I think this goes to our academic friends' um, point around the wider responsibility. It's not just a story of underfunding, but you know, I do think that NHS England um, is ultimately responsible for setting a specification, commissioning a service, anticipating demand. And I think it was it was an important question to put to NHS England. Mm. So I'll come to you in a moment, yeah. Uh, Mike Smith, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Uh, I just thought that everyone's been using in terms of huge and growing about the numbers and, and what's been going on. I just thought it would be really helpful to just give some concrete figures, if that's helpful. Perfect, yeah. So, um, yeah, there's been about... 20,000 referrals uh, since about 2008, something like that, to the service. There's obviously a big waiting list, so not that many people have been seen. Um, there was a recent paper with discharge outcomes, uh, which has been published, which showed that um, between 2008 and about uh, 2021, I think it was, um, something like fewer than 250 uh, young people uh, went forward who were under 16 to uh, access puberty blockers. And this is the only NHS service for every young person in England and Wales. And it's something like 1,100 in total for people uh, in JIDS uh, entirely, which is under 18 with a few over 18s. So um, the in terms of percentages, certainly the number of referrals has shot up hugely, but this is still in a, an astonishingly uh, small cohort. And uh, the sort of, given the numbers involved and the number of people accessing these who are who are that kind of age, yeah, the, the political and media attention to it is it's, it's it's notable, the kind of disparity given given other things that are going on. Uh, and Mike, what do you think? Because I, I, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we 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 came we came out of the reporting process. Well, I certainly did kind of looking at the transcripts and the uh, and and your reporting, much more aware of the um, concern within the NHS at the slowness of treatment and the impact that that was having on you know young people mental health and even this suicide number. But if I'm honest, I don't think that's the way we went into it. I, don't, I, I think that there was more of a, if you like, a London conversation, which was, why is this increase in referrals happening? And is there something around the prescription of puberty blockers and medical treatment and that option that is somehow uh, changing the expectations of young people and young people in particular geographies or particular schools. And I know this is a very unpopular thing, but the, the oh, how is it that what's the relationship between the conduct of JIDS, the um, the things that people are saying and seeing on social media, and 
public expectation that is driving that referral. I think that was probably more well, come to you in a moment. So, but but I, I wonder whether you could just because that because I just feel like we're reporting yeah, yeah, no, two that's... totally different stories, and we yeah, should yeah. be going Gosh, that's honest a, about it's it. a colossal complex question. Um, I think it's interesting. Like, did you work there? Is that how you? Know uh, so yes, much? yeah, yeah. So, I, but but not in the clinical capacity. So I don't, okay, I don't really know what I'm talking about. Um, otherwise, was, by the way, um, otherwise you are like the pub <laughs> quiz person. You want to have yeah. that knowledge of it. Um, is quite amazing. So. Um, there was uh, Oxford University uh, released a lot of um, research, including video and inter interviews with with parents and young people who have experience of uh, gender dysphoria in Britain and their access to healthcare and that sort of thing. Uh, it's on their website. I uh, can't remember the exact uh, web address. I'm sure you can put it in your YouTube description later or something. Uh, but lots and lots of the commentary there was just about uh, GPs not being aware, not having pathways in, not knowing about this stuff. So over the last decade, the, the awareness has absolutely skyrocketed. Um, so absent all the other for a super germane other factors going on, that's that that has to be a, a large part of it. But I wouldn't ever be able to talk proportion. I don't think. Okay. Is there, by the way, Jordan, any good? Because there's someone online, Joe Ruffles, put this thing that's saying, there's a, understanding the difference between the existence of gender dysphoria and the prevalence of it, and what the links. Are. I imagine there's quite a lot of work on that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to answer. Go that. close. Okay. <laughs> for I can see your point. Um, who's in? For, oh, yes. And I'll come to you soon in a moment. Um, I'm not going to give my name because I have a teenage daughter whose friends talk about nothing else. Yeah. And I don't want to embarrass her or cause her to be asked questions. Um, but I, I, th I think this, this, I mean, one, I would go back to Keith's first question about the ethics. And I do think there is a very radical difference between offering young people something that is potentially life changing permanently and offering them treatments that ease symptoms for a period of time. So I think the treatment of depression or ADHD or the examples that you give, they are different. Because I think you know, puberty blockers are potentially permanent changes and typically are given to people who are on a pathway or may take them to a pathway. Um, so I do think there's a huge ethical question around that. And I also, with great respect, I mean, you're, You've held the same view for eight view, eight years, which is a much longer portion of your life than it is mine. <laughs> so, <laughs> and there are many views I have held, life-changing decisions I have made that I've held for longer than eight years and sometimes uh, gone away with. I don't disrespect your view, but I've, it is longer. I also think on Jordan's point of view, that, that whole point about the length of the waiting list is not a symptom of success or failure at the Tavistock. It's a symptom of massive underfunding of CAMs for a very long period across mm. the country. So, you know, and I think there's a, a very particular thing, which is this is the only uh, mental health problem, I, I don't mean to say it's a, generally a mental health problem, but in that category, in which there is self-diagnosis as the driver. Uh, and we don't usually accept that people present and say, I have the answer, show me the route to the thing that's going to solve my problem. Uh, and that's that's a failure of CAMS. We don't have a CAMS infrastructure that is offering therapeutic support at an early enough stage before people have already, and I think you're right, that if, once people come on, they've been sitting there waiting for three years, they've pretty much decided and reached a stage where whatever views they have are very, very, very much firmer. And, and that may or may not be right, and we, you know, I, the, the the Dutch protocol has recently been, you know, again, very discovered that there's almost no data supporting it. And there are investigations going into what are the long term questions there. And I think it is an ethical question about but, but, at what stage you allow young people to take decisions that alter their lives forever. So so, I, so the reason why I think so I'm, I'm going to come to you in a Two people I'm come to in a moment, but can I just can I just flag up just because I think we shouldn't. Th there's a risk we tiptoe around something here, which is really, really, really is really difficult. And it, so obviously one of the issues is that that and we didn't address it as you can see because we were trying to understand the choices that were being made in the Tavistock. Oh. What I think you're pointing to is there are people who think that. There is something unethical about medical intervention for children, and there are a, there are a group of trans people, adults and children, who think we you can't shut that door, 
right, on ethical grounds, because the key moment for at which intervention counts is in those teenage years. And I think that we, and I think we've got to be honest with ourselves. It's a really, really difficult thing because if you, even for some people, opening up the conversation about the ethical nature of this feels like it's denial of the of reality of being a trans young person. And if we don't have the conversation, the reality is that there are a whole load of people who say, well, that's all very well. You're having a debate about, you know, a treatment of trans children, but with entirely with it on a certain set of terms and not within the terms that, you know, that you're raising here. And, and I just want to make sure that we're a place that you feel like you can actually say things on both sides, both sides of that argument, because they're because they are probably irreconcilable. Uh, there's a gentleman behind who is, Sarah, just next to you, and then I'll come to you, if I might, yeah. Uh, thanks, Tom Schiller. Uh, can I say, first, I'm really astonished and appalled there's no data tracking these people through. I mean, I, I was director of a think tank that dealt in longitudinal studies, and if ever there was an issue that demanded tracking and following through, this is it. So I find that really astonishing. Um, just, just to be clear, just, just to be, I just want to make sure we're getting that right. There was data. It was just a question of whether or not the data was sufficient. Is it? Is it well, I thought someone. Bernadette. 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 Bernadette, I'm going to come to, but, but I'll come to you in one second. So I've only heard your voice. I didn't know what you looked like. <laughs> but but my my question is this, and you you might rule it as being sort of out with the the area of debate tonight. I the 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 intergenerational divide on this. The gentleman referred to polarization. I've never encountered an issue where the polarization by age is so clear cut. And I I would like someone to explain to me why this is the case. I should say I've got no personal skin in the game, but the conversation yeah. is banned in our household by my wife because relations <laughs> with the granddaughter are uh, <laughs> you know, on this on this issue alone. I should say, I'll put it, yeah. but but as a serious issue, I can't. I mean, I'm you know, older people usually get maybe less liberal or whatever, but it, that it, that does not no. seem to explain it in this in this instance. So I would really like illumination on that. Tom, we'll, we'll do that. I'm come Sarah to and Steph, you, but actually, Bernadette, will you just, you, you said you were able to res respond. And we'll just introduce yourself if you're happy to, yeah. Yes, it's Bernadette Wren. I was just going to say something about the, the data collection. I don't want to sound too defensive about it because I did work in the so, service. So if you don't know, Bernadette, what it was, is the deputy at uh, uh, Yeah, did, I was yeah. a deputy. I was a senior clinician there, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, I think... Um, the question with most medical interventions, unless they're incredibly well established, is not is there data, but is how, what's the quality of the data and is it enough? Okay, so that, that's the first thing to say. And it relates to the thing I put my hand up about the first time, which is that these are all ethical questions. It's not like the outsiders are saying, is this ethical? Mm -hmm. The whole debate is ethical. And I'd like to speak to that in a minute. The question of following people through over the long haul, at the moment, the, the CAS review has recommended that all young people who want to access puberty blockers need to be enrolled in a treatment trial. They actually have to go to court to have a change in the law to make that possible because you cannot offer people with a coercive contract that they must be enrolled in a treatment trial. So there are huge ethical issues in the follow-up because if people as adults have a gender recognition certificate, they are living in that role legally now and it is illegal to follow them up to even Sorry, send. You have to explain that. Sorry, okay, if you had that, yeah. somebody who was on puberty blockers at fourteen or sixteen, and then as an adult they got a gender recognition certificate and they became legally in all ways that matter they became legally the sex other than the one that they were assigned at birth, it becomes illegal to follow them up as as people who were once. A boy. So if, I, so if I'm a boy, I go I go to kids, I get my yeah. puberty blockers 14, 15 years you old. You then go ahead, get further treatments or not, but you decide you're going to live as a woman. I get, so I'm now recognised with a gender yes. certificate as a woman. So I then couldn't what send you a letter in either your old name or your new name that said, hey, how are things for you now? Could you just give us some feedback? If Why? you look... Because of... Because it's because it is a, a privacy matter for that person that's now enshrined in law, that the 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 rights of people who change their their sexual designation by 
by law is protects them from those kind of queries about themselves. So as an employer, with anybody else, you can't ask them. You, you may not like that law, but it is the law of the land. Uh, and but we have to forgive me. It. Sorry, this, I, you know, this is not... Uh, no, no, not, not this is, so if I've had a treatment for a different illness and the NHS wants to follow up for evidence gathering reasons, can, can the NHS do that? If I've had not a... as an individual, you have to do it. You could, of course, there are follow up, but they're all group studies. You could not be identified as an individual. If you're, if people but are you can to... still with a group study, the, Tavistock could still, or the NHS could still follow up with me as a, um, you know, uh, but no, but you would have to give me information. If it's a matter of identity, I would have to contact you directly to say, do you still, are you still happy with the fact that you took this treatment? Do you still see yourself to be, you know, whatever. That's and, even for totally group, and even for a group study, that would be illegal. Well, what would, who would be the group? I'm sorry, the group would be very particular. I'd have to know exactly who you are. You're not going to be, I can't access your records. But my point, my point is that Hilary Cass's plan has to allow the NHS to access the health records of the young people. And as things stand, that is not strictly legal. And it's having to go to law to get permission. I'm not, I'm really not being over defensive. I'm just trying to explain no, one no, of the complexities of follow up research in this field, mm. quite apart from the other complexities that, that we've heard about yeah. um, of how it was difficult to follow people up. So, yeah. But it comes to just one other thing, which is this sort of this this kind of bigger internal external question. What did you say, you and Polly and colleagues, who just said, "Oh, this is not right. We we shouldn't be treating. We shouldn't we shouldn't be giving Peter puberty blockers to children at all." How? What was the response of the Tavistock to that? To people who worked there. No, no but people Sorry. who worked there. I'm imagining you met loads of people who had. Countless opinions. People who just said, "Oh no, we don't think this is right," because that's what the politicians are dealing dealing with, and the politicians. Okay, well, that that's very neatly. Thank you for yeah. that question because it connects to why I put my hand up in the first place, okay. was to say something about that. So many medical interventions now involve ethical questions. Okay, because forty years plus of medical law has determined that. It is not simply the decision of the doctor about what medication you or I will receive. What the patient wants, the patient's values are a huge part of it. The doctor, if it is indeed, if it's a doctor giving medication, has to act in what they take to be the patient's best interest, but they are the broad interest, taking into account many, many features of the patient's life. And clearly, in relation to some interventions, that's going to be more difficult yeah. than in others. And if you've got a very, you know, there's a paradigm case, you have a clear illness for which there is a treatment that is well evidenced, and it is of clearly to your health benefit in the narrowest sense of health to take this medication. Then there's a whole slew of difficulties that people come to doctors with, which are a combination of physical and psychological or you know, generally human well-being, for which there is not the brilliantly well-evidenced treatment, but there are a range of things that could or could not be done. And somewhere between the doctor's you know, duty of care, which also involves looking at the evidence, and the patient's desire, something is transacted. That is enshrined in case law since we know the 80s now, and the Montgomery case even more. You know, there has to be recognition of the wish of the patient. Now, I'm not saying you give out drugs willy-nilly, because I've just talked about duty of care oh, of and course. best interest. Huge part of it, and you would be, you know, rightly sued if you didn't if you didn't have your respo professional responsibilities. And those things are are regulated by professional bodies, by the CQC, and so on and so on. But it is a negotiation for many, many treatments that aren't those paradigm treatments. It's a negotiation. Some of those things are covered by, by law, but many aren't. Uh, and Bernard, can you just say, so when I, th when I listened to what Katie and Polly had done, I, I, f I felt, God, this is impossible. Right? If I'd worked in the Tavistock, I thought this is really, really difficult. And I would have loved, if I'd worked there, to have some air cover. I'd like someone to say, look, these are very, very difficult choices. And let me articulate for you the difficult ethical and practical choices we're making. One of the lessons here, it seems to me, is that it's not very clear in our system who, if anyone, does that. Who should be the person that explains how the NHS is operating 
to the public, right? not necessarily just to patients. You mean who should be talking about the public interest of the commissioning decisions that are made? Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, I think we can look to the absence of NHS England in the whole debacle. Can't so we? that's a that's a as it was Simon Stevens. Well, I think it's a bit unfair to call him to account for everything. But yes, but the people who were making commissioning decisions, who were receiving on a very regular basis, probably monthly, I can't remember, the data on the waiting list, the data on the the, the profile, the problematic, troubled profile of the young people on the waiting list, the people who were receiving that data have been absent from the conversation yes. very largely. And, you know, you could think you could have a, a CQC for commissioners. You know, the Tavistock for all the things that we may have got wrong. And I, since I retired from it, you know, I spent a lot of my time thinking about what I would have done differently. So I don't have any sort of false pride in it. But I do think that there are some responsibilities for commissioners here, which aren't really in, in the debate. Um, yeah. And so I think it, it's, you know, if we had commissioners here, we could we could we could listen for, we could listen to them, but I think the question of the public interest is a really really important one, but it's not always about whether the majority of the public thinks it's a good idea because an awful lot of what you might call I'm not including puberty blockers here, but what you might call advances in you know, the medical offer that's made in society is done in the vanguard of popular opinion. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I can't predict that puberty blockers will also be in the vanguard, but I'm talking about things like um, non-therapeutic sterilization, abortion, even sex reassignment surgery and so on. These things were, you know, once regarded with horror. They, you know, there's a shift, sort of small shift in, you know, opinion maybe amongst the, the providers of this kind of thing. It was all a bit under the radar at the beginning. And then there's another shift. But very often, the legal protections are, and the commissioning decisions are made in advance of the public thinking that they would well, approve of this, or the majority, the majority would approve of Well, in this case, certainly. Well, no, thank you. Steph, do you want to just answer Tom's point about generational? Yeah. Sure, as the, as the Gen Z of the company. Um, <laughs> yeah, one Gen Z to another. <laughs> of course, naturally. Um, I was actually going to come back to it, and I've got a couple of different points, but I'm very aware we've got less than 10 minutes left, so I will keep it brief. To answer your question, I think there is somewhat of a generational divide in the UK, specifically, because we're a much smaller population than many other countries. But I would not go so far as saying that the generational divide kind of supersedes it because there, there's evidence of 60-year-old 60, 60 trans people, 70-year-old, 80-year-old trans people. There are trans people at every single generation and have been documented for centuries. And so I wouldn't necessarily say it's a, it's a generational divide because I think that dismisses the lived experiences of so many. I, of course, would agree that there are, of course, a difference in opinions, of knowledge, of lived experiences between those generations. But I don't think we can allow that to perhaps supersede the conversation. I also wanted to come back to the funding question. And I think, personally, it's not down to Bernadette or to Polly Carmichael or anyone at the Tavistock to be responsible for those failures that may or may not have occurred. It is down to NHS England. Sing, in my personal opinion, as a patient who's been through the service, who is now out of the service and reflects, it is down to the lack of funding and fundamental oversight from NHS England and the commissioners because if you look at any other service in the NHS, there is the oversight, there is the knowledge, there is the key measurement. It just did not exist for Tavistock, it which I exist. think, period, which yeah. I think it just contributed to everything that has happened at the Tavistock. I don't think it's down to the people who work there. It, NHS England fundamentally failed to recognise that there was a growing need for the service and failed to scale in the way that was necessary. So, so Steph, I'm going to come, someone back there, 
Pardon. I just want to re relay some of the comments that are made, being made in the chat. There's one big thread around uh, people being suicidal and suicidality, i.e. those people who say they want to take their own lives and those people who are not necessarily going to take their own lives but say they do. There's, the, there's a big debate about that. There's some criticism of us in terms of the podcast, which was, well, if you do centre on Polly Carmichael, event, inevitably you're going to see things through the lens of the Tavistock. You might not see, th see things uh, um, more widely. There's quite a lot of talk about the CAMS point and about funding uh, uh, of the NHS. Um, and there's quite a lot of talk about us not talking enough about Hillary Cass. So we're going to need to come back to that. <laughs> yes. Hi, I'm Ruth. Um, I, it's so good to have Steph here. And Steph, I really hope you don't feel othered by, you know, all these people talking about something that's so personal to you. And, you know, for any individual case, what somebody needs and what they should receive is something that involves the conversation that they're in. And I think that's sort of separate to a wider conversation we're having. You, you asked at the beginning about where things should go, and I was mindful of your clock as well. And I was thinking, uh, pick up on Steph's point about the generational thing. I think something you didn't mention, but I think feels important, is that one of the things that seems very different in the youngest generation is the um, sex shift in who are the people who are coming forward with significant gender dysphoria, that there's now this yeah. huge, overwhelming, uh, overwhelmingly, it's, you know, it's teenage girls. Um, and I, the question I wanted to sort of pose to the room, and it picks up something that um, Polly said at the beginning, Polly used the word guardrails. I think there is something really interesting in this area that, and whether it's to do, you know, I think you, 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 James, you talked about, you know, social media here and activism and, and, and medical, you know, where the, the, the lines of causation go in all different directions, don't they? Um, but one thing that seems really clear to me is that the guardrails that we have for many years used to help our decision making don't seem to be applied to gender dysphoria amongst younger people in the way that they are in other conditions. So I, I think there's something very interesting about the treatment for body dysmorphia or some eating disorders, where to some extent there is some overlap in what people are experiencing, but in those areas we don't seem to be um, agreeing that making, making yourself thinner you know, yeah. getting rid of those ears that you hate or whatever. I don't want to be facetious about it. I think there's something interesting there. I also think if you talk to um, experienced social workers, I think there are some interesting questions about traditional safeguarding procedures and questions of do we allow young people to make decisions that are harmful for themselves? Those there's a much greater sensitivity about those old guardrails that have been applied pretty consistently in many areas of life. I think that's interesting, and I think it would be interesting journalistically to sort of ask those questions, because I think that's where there's quite an interesting intersection between, you know, the clamour in uh, society and culture and whatnot, and, and these really, really important decisions about um, young, you know, young people's well-being and, 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 and happiness and, and, and good... Good lives. I, I think. I think, Ruth. Just to be clear, I think that you really get to something that we we we, we didn't get to in the podcast, but certainly has knocked around the newsroom. Has been, and it's been, I think, the subject that sort of got people either kind of cheering or booing Hadley Freeman, which is what's this relationship between uh, anorexia uh, and particular the bodies of young girls going through puberty and. So body dysmorphia, body uh, gender dysphoria. And it, I think that there's a risk <laughs> that in order to focus on understanding the Tavistock, we haven't necessarily got into that. There's a great benefit, right, which is you actually do understand kind of some of the kind of institutional, political, and you know, clinical pressures that people are facing. But coming out of this conversation, the, the, there's another angle to it. I'm not sure exactly how we how, how we do that right. Sir and Sarah. In the blue jumper. I just wanted to mention um, that the Oxford study that that chap over there 
was talking about was completely infiltrated by mermaids and people who have a very strong commitment to a medical solution to this problem, which is actually many different diverse problems that's that are all poorly understood. And the, the healthcare advocacy in this area is a really important angle that I think is worth you all exploring in, in some future work that you do, mm -hmm. um, because there is no evidence. So people's <laughs> fairy tales and, the, and, the, and their goals for life and you know fills the vacuum basically and that's why evidence is really strong um bernadette will remember um appearing in front of a select committee in 2015 sitting next to susie green and there was a clear and sort of strident attempt by susie and mermaids to influence the clinical practice of jids to increase the availability of puberty blockers and also cross-sex hormones to lower the age at which they're available. Um, you go into the Mermaid's parent forum now and it's full of people who are accessing uh, gender GP stuff, which is basically what people do when they're too impatient to wait to, to, to be assessed Cross by GIDS. Sorry, gender that? GP is um, it's, it's an internet hormone supplier that's based in, I'm not sure where, but not in the UK. And um, so that, that so that's another area of the private, the, the way that the private sector has come in to, 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 to occupy the space that, that JIDS sort of didn't, basically. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll come back to you in a moment, but there was, who else was this? Hey, that hand up there, I hadn't, I was wondering if I hadn't heard from anyone. Someone I hadn't heard from? So, so yeah. You Oh, yeah, Sorry, go, go just, can I just say very controversially, yeah. you referred to someone being assigned at birth. Can I just scotch that? Mm -hmm. You are not assigned at birth. You are male or female or, in a very small minority, both. But, but can, can I say, but the, the, can I, the interesting thing is I'm interested, for example, just as what you said by the way, we used the word infiltrated, right, around mermaids. So there's obviously an attempt by an organisation like that to influence the debate, right? How do we deal with this question? And Polly, you and Katie dealt with a lot, which was just this kind of sense of people trying to set the terms of language, control the kind of scientific outcomes in order to have you, if you like, kind of established facts. And I, I'm just I'm just interested to know, and I guess it's a bit to your point, Tom, why is it that we are finding it so hard to have a conversation about this and so hard to you know, disagree when, you know, heaven knows, you know, if you covered the Middle East, you'll know, you know, there, there are things that we, we, people have disagreed before. So I'm just wondering why, why you think there is such suspicion around the way in which these organizations work. Sorry, but just the use of infiltration yeah, was interesting to me because it was like, I feel like, when I hear that word, I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Well, I, I sorry, I, I can't account for my use of that particular word, um, but obviously they have been extremely effective and right. good at what they wanted to happen, which is to make these medical approaches more broadly accepted and available. Um, I just think they've been overtaken by this sea of different sorts of people who seek um, these interventions, basically, and um, they talk about NHS England being at fault, I mean, they surely are, but also clinicians have responsibility and they really ought to have done a better job, in my opinion. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna forgive me, I know there are a few other hands up, but I'm also aware of the time, which obviously I have not been aware of the time. So there, there's also, time. sorry, there's a, there's someone on Twitter called Mediocre Druid, who Bernadette knows because she was um, her clinician. And she, oh, if she's on Twitter, she might want to look up the account of Mediocre Druid. Okay. Um, Could, um, I'm going, to, I'm going to go in the end, if I might, back to you, Polly and Katie, right, if I could, because I think that if you've ever done a long, long piece of reporting, you typically get to the very end of it and go, oh, damn, <laughs> that was the story. <laughs> That's the story that we should go after next. And I wondered whether you had thought about that and where you think the next... The, the, in terms of understand, a better understanding, and that's our business, is trying to make sense of things, where where we could helpfully go to get to some better understanding. Mm. You've got the mic there. Um, so, I, I mean, I think there is the question which we, we haven't quite got to here, which is what happens now? How do we set up new services that don't succumb to the same kind of pressures and heat at the central center of the debate so and that there is a huge amount of difficulty in setting up the new services at the moment and they won't be hitting the deadlines that of, of having a new service in place for the spring which is what, what what's meant to happen um 
honestly, I think kind of there's there's some fantastic reporting that's been done by others. There's a book coming out on Tavistock. I think I think kind of capturing what happened at Tavistock is only useful now in terms of how you go about setting up the new services. And I think we are a, a, a society in flux trying to understand what we think. I think what will happen now is an overcorrection um, in terms of a backlash against trans rights to, to a certain extent. And, and I look at my daughter's generation, I look at the young people coming up today, that will correct again. I think there will be a kind of seesaw effect over what the right thing to do is and um and we will reach a kind of societal settled view at some point um but i think we've got several rocky chapters to go i think the two things that really there are two areas that really interest me on a wide level one is one is this changing nature of parenting that i think kind of we've this this story's given us a window into and um, all the stuff around attachment parenting and affirmative parenting, all of those things, kind of what, what's, the, what's the limit of that? Because parenting has certainly changed um, in my generation. Um, and, and I think there's a wider question, you know, this, the idea that Bernadette introduced in the, in the um, podcast about looping effects and looping effects in the age of social media in lots of different ways, in the rise of lots of different referrals of lots of different illnesses, I think are really interesting. So low, I think There's loads of different areas to go at. Um, but I think what matters is, is how we look after a really vulnerable group of young people. Katie, was there anything you want? And, and, a, group, and a group of people who right now have pretty much nowhere to be referred to because of where the service is at the moment. But the, the comment the gentleman just said uh, just then about gender GP reminded me that there was quite a lot we couldn't fit in the podcast because obviously we did six episodes and we would um, we couldn't get everything in. But that point about private medicine, that while um, particularly while the NHS tries to work out what it's going to offer, there is a danger that private medicine moves into that space and that's completely unregulated and i think there's a story there that that, that there's more to be done on all right well th thank you listen thank you very much please do stick around and and you know sort of you may well do a better job figuring this out you know together than we've done it all together um i, I, I suppose i'll just take away three or four things if i might um one is uh I come away, and, and Bernadette, this is possibly a sort of kind of wishful thinking. I come away thinking about how, what do you do when you don't have either the evidence or a clear political or scientific um, basis on which to act, but you nonetheless have someone in front of you and you have to make a choice. And, and I do think there's a question in my mind, which is about what's the institutional um, uh, uh, way in which ethical decisions, um, health decisions are communicated to the public. Because the thing I come away from this most of all, if I was kind of to mark our own homework in terms of our own podcast, is there is still a massive debate here fundamentally around this, this generational divide, Tom, this point that, you know, uh, Keith, you made and you made around, okay, can you explain the ethics of this decision, right? And, and I do think that, you know, your point, Polly, is right, is that the risk is that without some kind of settled understanding, public understanding, is that you get something that is either, that, that's just contested in every way. It's either reactionary or it's out of step with where public opinion is. So I think that golfing understanding question is really interesting. And I do think there's a big question. I mean, you said NHS England, that seems sensibly the institution for me that you would like to say, go out in public and answer and explain. I was really interested, I think for us in this personal privacy, public knowledge question, how do you respect the individual, but get the evidence that gives any people some kind of uh, uh, additional confidence. Um, journalistically, there are two obvious big questions, which is what replaces the Tavistock, right? It, you know, who are these guys? They're gonna be better, any better, what's that gonna be? And I think that the public-private medicine point that you made gender GP just now, I think is really um, interesting. Um, I, I, I'm just finished by saying this, 
I'm really struck by the fact that there are two totally different pools, even in discussing this story. Um, one is about the experience of those people who received care, and the other is about the principle of care and the public interest of care. And I do think that there's an issue about how we in the media discuss health, because it feels like it's hard to get groups of people together where these things are quite so contested and discuss them. Uh, on that note, I'd just like to say thank you for making the time. Thank you to the many, many people who've joined us online. It is a, a, a big, long chat, which we will go through and pick up all of those points. Um, but, um, you know, a word of advice, don't walk on the heath, you might get a call. Uh, and it'll end up in a long, long story. So a big thank you to Katie and Polly, uh, who've helped us understand this uh, in all their work over the last few months. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for watching that video. There's plenty more over on our channel, so just click here to subscribe.